Well, Baruch Hashem, we are going to um, be diving into a topic today that I we started out with last week about Ezekiel 18, that uh, a man shall die for his own sins, or the soul that sins will shall die is our topic today from Ezekiel 18, the soul who sins shall die. And I mentioned last week that this passage uh, is one of the passages that is used by anti-missionaries to say, we don't, have, we, don't have, we don't need a Messiah. We don't need a Messiah because no one can die for your sins and you can't die for somebody else's sins. And so as a result, there's no need for a Messiah because you can't die for somebody else's sins, right? And so that's clearly stated in the Tanakh. And for people, listen, it's been my contention now for a long time that people who believe in the Messiah... By and large, it's almost, I mean, it's, there's exceptions to every rule, but the rule seems to be that they are intimately familiar with a man's letters and have a cursory understanding of the Tanakh. And when they do study the Tanakh, they do so from the prism of that man's letters. You know, Judaism studies the Tanakh, and we study the Tanakh, and we look into to sources that, are, that span millennium. We look at sources through, the, through how did this ancient sages, how did they view this, this particular passage? Many of them, the people we're reading about who say, well, this, this passage means that. They were there when that passage was written. It's a big difference, right? Um, but many people, when they read the, the Tanakh today, they read it from the, from the viewpoint of the letter writer as opposed for just letting the text interpret it itself or, or what have you. But in any case, they don't know the Word of God. They don't have a firm understanding. They don't have a firm grasp. And so it's very easy if I came to you and said, listen, nobody can die for your sins, you can, and you can't be held accountable for somebody else's sins. As it says here in the Bible, I'm going to show you in Ezekiel 18, and all of a sudden your world is thrown into chaos. And as I said last week, one of the other problems here is because of what's taught about the, the gospel of the alleged Messiah. What's taught about that gospel is, is that yet the Messiah died for your personal sins. A lot of people believe that. They're taught to believe that. That, in fact, is the entire mindset of getting, quote, unquote, saved. Come forward, confess your sins, accept JC as your personal atonement for your personal sins. And you have to do that because if you don't do that, then there's no way for you to get your sins forgiven. That's what people are taught because that's what they read in the letters, the problem is, and this I'm, I'm trying, this is very, by the way, this is a challenging subject to, to teach because it's nuanced and there's some yes and no and maybe in there and you have to actually think. I can't put this message on a bumper sticker. You're going to have to use that gray matter between your ears to actually think things through. Okay, And this is the problem in our modern society particularly, but it's not limited to our modern society, that people, are, they just want, give it to me in two seconds. And that's, life doesn't work that way. Okay, So it's real easy for, for when you have that mindset for me to come and say, first of all, the Tanakh clearly says that you don't need blood to get forgiveness. The idea of needing blood to get for forgiveness is not found anywhere in the Scriptures. Secondly, no one can die for your sins or you can't be held accountable for somebody else's sins. Personal accountability is a fundamental tenet in the Tanakh. Number two, that, that uh, since that's the case, there's, you have no need for anybody to die for your personal sins. You can't you can't run up the bill on the credit card and just get debt forgiveness, right? Now, what I'm saying right here is not motivating a lot of people. I can tell by the looks on your faces because you're like, wait a minute, I've heard this my whole life. I get it. 
This is the problem. This is why you have to understand who the Messiah was really and what he really came to do because if you don't, you'll be thrown into this turmoil. And many people have denied the true Messiah. Well, they've denied the false Messiah, actually. They've denied JC, but they haven't given any attention to Yeshua, the true Messiah, because of everything they heard in church, they think that that was his message in the Gospels, but it wasn't. The letter writer's message was not the message of the Gospels. Did Yeshua come to be a ransom? Yes, but he said, and I quote, I came to be a ransom for many, not for one. And that throws a lot of people off. But his whole point was to come and undo uh, the whole macro level of, of issues that would lead eventually to the redemption of Israel, which I'm going to explain with God's help today, okay? So we have to understand this concept. I, I spent last week talking about the fact that on the one hand, no, man can, no one can die for another man's sins. Personal accountability. Would you agree with me, just don't raise your hand, would you agree with me today that one thing our society could use a whole lot more of is personal accountability? Okay. Are, is any, don't raise your hand, but has anybody had kind of enough of the victim mentality? Okay. We could use this message today because the failure to take personal accountability, we had, this is the reason why we have people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s still blaming their bad attitude on mommy and daddy. Okay? That ain't going to fly. That dog don't hunt. All right? So, that's, that's, that's something else. But we also learned last week, on the, on the one hand, nobody can die for your sins, and you can't die for somebody else's sins. And yet, it is absolutely a Jewish tenant that the Messiah comes to die for the sins of Israel. That is an absolute fact. Now, it might, that might, those two things might seem contradictory, and I would agree with you, if you don't think it through, they can seem contradictory unless you understand what the sins that he's dying for are. They're not your personal sins. They're the sins of the entire nation. They're the sins of the entire people, not your personal sins. I'm not going to really dive into this topic today, but there is a whole concept of the idea of original sin. And I intend, with God's help, to eventually do a teaching on this that I planned the title Adam made me do it. It's a, very, it's a very interesting concept. It's also complex. It's also nuanced. But the idea of original sin, as people understand it today, is all Paul, 100%. It was his invention, 100%. Judaism doesn't believe in, in original sin, as Christians understand. Christian, the Christian idea of uh, excuse me, original sin is that you're born a sinner, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's why you need JC. The problem is, and then Paul took it a step further, and he utilized that platform to disparage the Torah, and he actually blasphemed God, and he indicted the Torah as being complicit in making the sin an even worse sinner. And that's why he, that's why in his redemption scheme, his part of his program was the jettison in the Torah because it was part of the problem. And today, believers still believe that. As I mentioned, one of the, what I said during the transition from the worship to the Torah reading section of this service was very important, that a lot of people who believe allegedly in J.C., the, the, the supposed Messiah from the Gospels, they're still in spiritual bondage because they still believe. I've had people, I can't tell you how many people have told me, nobody can keep the law of Moses. Nobody can keep the law. Nobody can keep the Torah. 613 commandments. Are you kidding me right now? Nobody can do that. And yet, we do it every day. And yet, people have for thousands of years. And the only people who say it can't be done are the ones who've never tried it. But more importantly than that, the law of Moses is literally the definition of what sin is not. 
to, to sin is to break the law of Moses. Therefore, if you say, I, no one can keep the law of Moses, what you're really saying is nobody can, can be a, not a sinner. And that is a very depressing and very much a defeatist attitude, that you're incapable of not being a sinner. And if that were true, then why would we need a Messiah in the first place? Since you're incapable of not being a sinner, why does he have to come rescue for something you can't help but do? Why would you be guilty of it? Yaakov, can you breathe? Can you live without breathing? I'm going to put you in jail for that. Stop breathing right now. If you don't stop breathing right now, I'm going I'm I'm to put you in prison. Okay, see? Pedro, can you fly? I mean, without, an, without any kind of machinery I'm talking about. Jump off the interstate, Empire State Building. Can you fly like a bird? No? You're going to be able to prison for that. You know that? I'm going to throw you in prison because you can't fly. Now, if I said something so dumb like that, how many people would say, well, that's not just. How many say it's not just for me to throw Yaakov because he can't stop breathing or, or Pedro in, because he can't fly like a bird? How many you know throwing them in prison would be wrong? It would be unjust, wouldn't it, right? Now, see, everybody's saying, I can't help but break the law of Moses. Then why would God send you to hell for something you can't help but doing? That's, that's the epitome of injustice. It's not, however, if you have a choice. It's not, however, if you're capable and you choose not to. I've offered this Pepsi challenge many times. I said, show me one of the 613, just one that you can't do or you wouldn't be able to do. I've yet to have anybody ever say, well, I can't, I can't, not, you know, I, that, here's one. You know why? Because it doesn't exist. That mentality comes from the letter writer and it's bondage. People wonder why I say Christianity is bondage. I just told you why. It's bondage because it keeps you bound to an idea that you can't when God told you you could. Why does, why does the Satan want to tell you through a man or through letters or through any other means that you can't do it? Why? Because he wants to keep you in Egypt because he doesn't want you to go to Mount Sinai. Understand that leaving Egypt was about going to Sinai. The reason we're going to have the Passover here this week is because we're on our way to Shavuot. That's the reason. Well, that was my introduction. Let's say the blessing. We're done. That's it. <laughs> Blessed are you, Adonai, God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. Please, Adonai, God, sweeten the words you have told in our mouth and the mouth of your people, the house of Israel. May we and our offspring, the offspring of your house, of, the, the people, your house of Israel, all of us, know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, Adonai, who teaches Torah to his people, Israel. Rob Nosem said in his prayer, it's just another wonderful uh, prayer here, just to give you another example. He said, Master of the world, send abundant salvation at every moment from the holy wellsprings of salvation that never cease flowing. The true Zadikim joyfully draw from the waters of Torah, which are the wellsprings of salvation. Rescue me in the merit of these Zadikim who have the power to shield and rescue all who take refuge in them from the grave or worse and lead them to eternal life. Rob Nosem, a Hasidic rabbi of, associated with the Breslov movement, understood what Jews understand, and that is that ultimately our salvation, ultimately our righteousness is through a Zadik, a righteous person. That's why we need Messiah Yeshua. Let's look at Ezekiel 18 and see what Ezekiel is saying. Let's read this chapter, which is in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18 on page 1245. Just kidding. But it in my book anyway. It says, The word about Adonai came to me saying, Why do you relate this parable upon the land of Israel, saying, The fathers eat sour grapes, but the teeth of the sons are set on edge. Now, let's pause here for just a moment. First and foremost, 
Whenever we're studying Scripture, I want you to do something with people, which people rarely, if ever, do. Are you ready? This will make you a scholarly genius if you follow this advice. Are you ready for this? Read in context. Read in context. A text te- taken out of context becomes a pretext, okay? Paul, I'm sorry to mention his name, but I have to, did this all the time. But he did something worse. Not only did he take verses out of context and completely manipulate them, but he very often intentionally mistranslated them to to say something they absolutely did not say at all. And here is the thing that drives me crazy. No one ever checks. No one ever looks it up. Paul says, the scripture says this, no one ever goes to see if it says that. Turns out it doesn't, 99% of the time. But I digress. He's saying here, the prophet is saying, what is it with this parable in Israel? The fathers eat sour grapes, but the teeth of the sons are set on edge. What is he talking about? What he's talking about is that there's a saying in Israel at this time. And the saying is, our fathers sinned and we suffer the consequences. That's the parable. Our fathers ate sour grapes and our teeth are set on edge. That's what it means. What's going on here is the context of 18, and this is critical because anti-missionaries, as I said last week, I'm for anti-missionaries trying to destroy Christianity. I'm, I'm for that. What I'm not for is doing it seemingly dishonestly, okay? And you can't take 18 out of its context. To say that what's presented here is the idea that no one can die for your sins or you can't die for somebody else's sins is a falsehood. What is being written here in 18 is this. The people are trying to play the blame game. They're trying to say, Why are we being punished for something our fathers did? Why are we going to be thrown into exile and the temple destroyed when our fathers were the ones who started all this mess to begin with? And the prophet is trying to tell them, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, that dog won't hunt. You have a role to play in this too. You have a role to play. That's what's saying. That's what the prophet is starting out saying. The prophet is starting out saying, don't say that we're being punished for something our fathers did. Okay, so he says, as I live, the word of the Lord Adonai Elohim, I swear that there will no longer be anyone among you who uses this parable in Israel. Why is he saying that? Because he says, you're going to come to realize that you're to blame here. You're part of the problem. Behold, all souls are mine like the souls of the father. So the souls of the son, they are mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. So Hashem is making a statement here. You're dying because of your sin. You can't blame it on Papa. Okay? That's the point he's trying to make. But remember, keep it in context. This is about my sins. People say our sins aren't. One of the things they were saying, as the commentators have said, is one of the things is our sins weren't as bad as theirs. So how come you didn't punish them in their time? You know, they did a lot worse. How come you didn't punish them then? Our sins are not as bad, so why are we being punished? That's another thing that's being said here. Verse 5, if a man is righteous and practices justice and righteousness, he does not partake of idolatrous sacrifices upon the mountains, does not lift his eyes towards the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife nor approach an impure woman. Now, notice, by the way, just as an aside, it says here that you did not partake of idolatrous sacrifices upon the mountains. Remember, I just want to remind you, the letter writer said that was perfectly fine to do. He said it was perfectly fine for you to do it because an idol doesn't mean anything. So if you find yourself at the, the, the uh, goddess idol restaurant and you happen to be eating, that's perfectly fine. Just don't let anybody see you eating. It was totally confusing. Remember that? Remember I talked about that? We went through that whole thing. We were, y'all were all confused when I, when I finished reading the chapter because you didn't know at the end of the chapter what he was, was trying to say. Like, should you eat there or not eat there? But if you do eat there, don't let somebody see you eat there because if they see you eat there, that's on them because they're weak, but you still shouldn't let them see you because you might think it's something bad too. 
exactly. I'm not, you think I'm joking, but I'm not. But once again, when you go to the scriptures, you find God saying, yeah, don't do that. Okay? So it's not okay to go to an idolatrous restaurant and eat idolatrous food. That's not okay. But it goes on to say, does not, you do not oppress any man. You return a collateral for debt. You do not rob or loot, give his bread to the hungry, cover the naked with clothing. Does not give loans with usury, nor take interest. Withholds his hand from corruption, execute true justice between man and man. Goes according to my decrees and observes my ordinances to practice truth. He is a righteous man. He shall surely live the word of the Lord, Adonai Elohim. So listen, that's an important paragraph I just read. Because Hashem has given you the definition of a Zadik. The definition of a Zadik is somebody who follows the law of Moses. And God is saying that if you are a Zadik and you, as a, because you follow the law of Moses, you will live. Interestingly, this is exactly what Yeshua said in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, Yeshua is asked point blank, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Yeshua says, believe in me and just confess your sins and that's fine. I'll do it for you. No, actually, that's not what he said. Yeshua said, what does the law say? The man quotes the Shema and Yeshua says, yeah, that's right. Do that and you'll live and walks away. Do the law and live. Now, let me pick on somebody else here. Let me pick on Yosef. Yosef. Yosef, if God told you, gave you a whole paragraph, I just read it to you, Yosef, gave you a whole paragraph in Scripture and said, Yosef, if you do this, which is to summarize my law, the Torah, you do this, then you'll be a Zodic, and as a result, Yosef, you'll live. Now, Yosef, what if you set out to do that only to find out that God was Hasve Shalom? gaslighting you because you can't do that. You're not capable of doing that. Exactly. Would that be just? No. So if, I, if God gave you commandments and said, do this and you'll be, you'll be a righteous person and you'll live, and you do it because, you know, you trust God, and then only to find out that God said, well, the reason, Richard, I gave you those commandments to do is so that you could find out that you couldn't do it. Now, Richard, if I was your dad and I said to you, hey, Richard, man, I want you to go out there and I want you to do this, 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 and this. And if you do that, you're going to get a big financial reward. I'm going to give you a big payout for doing that. And you're like, man, I need to buy that new car. Dad said, go do this and I'm going to get a big reward. You come back and you failed and you said, hey, dad, I tried, but I wasn't able to do it. And I, I just said, "That's Richard, I, knew you, I, I gave you that because I knew you wouldn't be able to do it. Would you trust me as your father next time I told you? But, I got, but listen, I got a new promise for you, Richard. Is that how life works, Richard? Now, he is a smart man back there. He knows. He gets it. You don't trust a used car salesman once he sold you the lemon. You don't go back to him. But, see, and none of that makes sense, what I just said. But that's what the letter writer told you. But the truth is, is that you can do it, which is why God told you to do it. And, since, and that's how you're held accountable. You see how this works? It's really not complicated. When we can do something and we choose not to, that's when accountability sets in. Now, Richard, what if you came back to me and said, hey, Pop, I couldn't do that. And I said, I know you couldn't. I gave you that task, Richard, so that you would see how weak and worthless you are. And you said, well, thanks, Dad. And then I said, and by the way, Richard, not only are you not going to receive a reward because you couldn't do what I told you to do because I set you up for failure, but not only that, now I'm going to punish you severely for it. Does that sound even, that's even a better one, right? Now we've even upped the ante. Now we get to go to hell for doing something we couldn't help but do. Yeah, it's, it's sadistic, isn't it? But that's the gospel people have been taught. You can't keep the law, no one can, so you go to hell for it. Well, wait a minute, why am I going to hell for something I can't help but do? Exactly. But people buy this stuff, that's, they're not taught to think. So it says in verse 10, if he begets a violent son who sheds blood, who does any of these sins to his brother, who does, do, does not do all these good deeds, for he even partakes of idolatrous sacrifices upon the mountains. Did he let somebody see him do it? Anyway, 
defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and the needy, robs, loots, does not return collateral, lifts his eyes towards the idols, commits abominations, gives loans with usury and takes interest. Should he live? He should not live. He has committed all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood will be upon himself. So now it's saying, if your father was righteous and the son is a sinner, the son's going to die. The son's not going to live because his father was righteous. Now, this is also very important. We're, we're, seeing, we're unraveling a lot of bad theology here. If you're somebody who doesn't follow the law of Moses, you're not going to be able to rely on somebody who does. And this is important because many people say to me, I can't, I mean, if I had a dime for every time this has been said to me, how many, how many times has it been said to you? J.C. fulfilled the law. How many of you have heard that? He fulfilled the law. What's the implication in their mind? The implication in their mind is he fulfilled the law, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. He fulfilled the law so that you don't have to. He did it for you. So now you can carry on breaking the law wholesale, but don't worry about it. You're still going to go to heaven because he did it for you. That idea is what I've just read to you in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 5 through verse 13. That you have Yeshua who did all the law perfectly and righteously, and now you get to be the evil son who doesn't do anything right. And you can just rely on his grace. God is telling you that 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 doesn't fly. Now, is it true that Judaism today, as I just read in Rob Nosom's book, wherever I put it, that is it true that we cling to, here it is, we cling to exotic and and we, 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 we pull down their righteousness? This is what it means, by the way, when Yeshua says, anyone who prays in my name, to, that's a Jewish idea. To pray in somebody's name, quote unquote, means to pray in their merit because their name indicates who they are. So to pray in their merit. So is that true? Yes. But keep in mind that all the righteous Jews who believe that are all striving to live righteous lives. But that what, what do they realize? They realize that we're human beings and that we all make mistakes Do we look at our righteousness and we say, you know, I wish I was better. And so we reach out to those who are better than us and say, God, let me, let me, let me glean some of their merit onto my life. So that's what we do with Yeshua. We look at Yeshua and say, Yeshua, you're the perfect Zadik. You're the perfect Messiah. You're the living Torah. I'm striving to live Torah, but I know that I, I fall short. So I, I pray in your name. I ask God to bless me in your name. Every Jew does that at Yom Kippur. We come to Yom Kippur and we say, I have no, nothing to bring you. I have no good works to bring you, which, by the way, isn't exactly true because everybody who's at Yom Kippur, not everybody, but a lot of people at Yom Kippur are all righteous Jews who, who strive to serve God. But yet we come before him and say, we have nothing. Please look at the Akedah of Isaac and consider as if I laid my life down like he did. But what I'm trying to articulate to you, it doesn't mean that we just give up and say, yeah, I'm not even going to try. I'm going to eat pork. I'm going to worship idols. I'm going to chase bunny rabbits and colored eggs. I'm going to just live like a total heathen and just say when it comes to judgment day, well, you know, I didn't even give it a shot. But look, he did it for me. That's not how it works. And even Yeshua said so. Yeshua said so in Matthew chapter 7. For all the people that are saying, see, uh, J.C. did the Torah for me, so I don't have to. And yet, in Matthew chapter 7, Yeshua says explicitly, I don't, get away from me, I don't know you, those who failed to keep the law of Moses. He says it, ex- he says it ex- explicitly when he says, workers of iniquity. So, it goes on to say, In verse 14, then if he begets a son who sees all the sins of his father that he had done, he sees, now let's talk about the grand, this is the grandson now. We had the father who was righteous, the son who was a wicked one, and now we have the grandson, okay? The grandson sees his father's sins, but does not act like them. He does not partake of the idolatrous sacrifices upon the mountains, 
does not lift his eyes towards the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife, does not oppress any man, does not keep collateral, does not rob any food, gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with clothing, withholds his hand from harming the poor, does not take any user interest, obeys my ordinances, and follows my decrees. He shall not die for his father's iniquity. He shall surely live. So again, in three paragraphs, Hashem has made it clear what sin is and what sin is not. And he's making it clear that if you live a righteous life, even if your dad was a total reprobate, you're still going to be considered righteous. Okay? So the idea, of, this is what trips people up because now they're like, wait a minute. I'm not held accountable for my father's sin. I'm held accountable for my own sin. That's not taught in religious circles. What's taught in religious circles is everybody's a sinner because Adam was a sinner, and therefore you're automatically a sinner. But that's not exactly true. So it goes on to say in verse 18, his father, because he was cruelly oppressed others, has robbed, looted from his brothers, and did not did that which is not good among his people. Behold, he died for his sins. Yet you who say, why did the son not bear the iniquity of the father? But the son performed justice and righteousness and observed all my decrees and performed them. He should surely live. The soul that sins, it shall die. So again, Hashem is saying, this is about personal accountability. But keep in mind the context of this chapter. He's talking to a people who are living a sinful life. And as a result, they're going to go into exile. They're trying to blame it on their fathers and so forth. And God is saying, no, you've continued the sin of your father. It says, a son shall not bear the iniquity of his father. And the father shall not bear the iniquity of his son. The, the righteousness of the righteous person shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked person shall be upon him. Now, the sages pointed out in the con commentary here that there seems to be a contradiction because in the Scripture, God explicitly says in the Torah that he will bring about the judgment and the sins of the fathers onto the generations. And so the sages talk about this in the commentary, and they make the statement that it's not a contradiction. What it's saying there is that if the son continues on in the sin of his father, not only does he bear his own sin, but then he will bear the sin of his father as well. But if you, the son, in this analogy, make a break with your father and say that we're not going to continue in that way anymore, then his sin is not held to you. So as you see here, one of the things that's often taught in that other religious world is the idea of breaking generational curses. How many of you have ever heard that, that expression? The way to break a generational curse is not rebuking the devil. Come at you, foul spirit. That's not how you break a generational curse. You don't break a generational curse by, as I was taught in another lifetime decades ago, by saying, well, I take authority over my daddy or my mommy who did this, that, or the other, and I break that curse, blah, blah. The devil just goes, okay. You continue to eat that pork chop, and I continue to have a road into your life. Continue to dance around that decorated tree, and I, my little minions continue to dance around your house. Continue to just break all the, continue to ignore the Shabbat, act like God never said that, and I continue to have all the authority I need in your life. You can sit there and mouth all you want to, break this, break that, whatever. The way to break generational curses, God just told us, is by following the law of Moses. You want to break a generational curse in your life, stop living like your father lived. You got to live like your father lives. That's how you break the generational curse. This is why the non-Jews who want to become Jews, once they come to the mikvah to become Jews, they're fully Jewish in every respect. So much so that they break, they break 
the family generation. They're now, that's why they're called, we say you're, you're, if you're a, do, a, a man, you're a son of Abraham. If you're a, a, a woman, you're a daughter of Abraham. It's Abraham and Sarah. That's not just a cute little epitaph. That's actually literal. You are literally a son of Abraham and Sarah, literally. So, he says, as for the wicked man, verse 21, as for the wicked man, if he repents from all his sins that he committed and the observance of my decrees and practice and justice and righteousness, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All this, all his transgressions that he committed will not be remembered against him. He shall live because of the righteousness that he did. Do I desire at all the death of a wicked man? The word of the Lord, Adonai Elohim, is it not rather that he should return from his ways that he might live. Now, listen, this is a very important sentence God just said. God gave us the way to become righteous, just in that one sentence. Anything about blood in there? Mm -mm. How many of you know there were lots of people who went into exile in the Babylon? How many know that when we went into exile in Babylon, the temple was destroyed, and therefore all the sacrifices ceased? How many of you, there were people in Babylon, Jews, who became repentant and they returned their hearts to the Lord? And as a result, they were brought back from Babylon. Are you aware there were no sacrifices that mitigated that, that situation? What people don't understand is that God is so full of grace and mercy that he says to us, all you have to do is repent. And turn away from your sin, and I will consider you a Zadik. There's no blood, there's no sacrifice, there's no, all you have to do is say, God, I want to be a righteous person and start to walk that way, and I will meet you. This is what the prodigal son was all about. The prodigal son story was just about this. Yeshua told this story. Notice in the prodigal son story, there is no blood. Notice in the prodigal son story that the robe was put on his shoulders and the ring was put on his finger and the other brother got mad and there was no atoning sacrifice, but just a heart that said, I want to return to the ways of my father. Now, you might be confused because you might think, but wait a minute, don't y'all believe that Yeshua was an atonement? Yes, but it's, it's not about, we're ta- this chapter is about your personal sin, your personal life. Yeshua came to be an atoning work for Klal Israel, for all of Israel. You say, well, wasn't it for the whole world? No, actually it wasn't. It was for all who would join the covenant who would become Israel. He didn't die that the whole world could be saved because if that were the point, then what would be the point? You actually have to make a choice to join the covenant. Salvation is for the Jews. You say, well, that's not fair. Yes, it is. You can become a Jew. The choice is yours. This is going back to the key and the box at the bank. A lot of people want to go to the bank, break into it in the dead of night, and steal the box. They don't want the key. And then they're mad when it doesn't work out and they go to jail. It's like, if you just come get the key, you can have access to the box. This is what happens when Gentiles want to have all the blessings of the covenant without any of the responsibilities. They want to be Israel. They want to be the replacements. They want to have all the salvation and all the blessing. But are you living a Jewish life? Well, no, I don't want that. I just want to be a Gentile. I want to eat pork. I want to have all this kind of stuff. Well, you know, you don't know you, that doesn't work. You, you don't get to wear the uniform if you don't join the military. That's called stolen valor. Those of us who are veterans don't appreciate stolen valor very much. You're not even really, I don't know how it is for other service branches, but you're not even really supposed to wear any clothing that has an eagle globe and anchor on it if you weren't a Marine or married to one. If you're walking around and you're wearing an eagle globe and anchor T-shirt and I stop you and say, hey, were you in the Marine Corps? And you go, oh, no, I wasn't. Oh, that's not good. Are you, is your spouse a Marine? If you say yes, okay, fine. But anyway, 
And when a righteous man turns away from his righteous and practice corruption, shall he do like the abominations that the wicked man did and live? No. All his righteousness that he had done will not be remembered. So again, it's all merit-based. Now, let me just pause here because I'm running out of time. I, there's so much about this, my goodness. We're talking here about individual sin. We're talking about individual sin. Now, let's get a little confusing for a second, shall we? Yeshua came to die for our sins. That's a true statement. But it wasn't your individual sin and your individual sin and your individual sin and your individual sin, but rather for the sins of mankind. And there were three specific things why Judaism, I'm I'm just, I'm having a rush right quick, so pardon the just blanket statements here. There are three basic things that culminate the reason why we need the redemption from Mashiach. You see, the anti-missionary would try to tell you that, well, we don't need Messiah. All you need is repentance and all this kind of stuff. It's, that's, that's true and not true. Keep in mind that in Yeshua's day, they were looking for the Messiah, but it wasn't just to get them liberated from Rome. There was something much deeper than that. They were looking for a Messiah who would bring a redemption, a spiritual redemption. Why? There were three things in human history that necessitates a spiritual redemption. One is the sin of Adam. Now, contrary to the Paulinian view, the sin of Adam does not make you a hopeless sinner, incapable of not sinning. That's Paul's idea. And God gave you the Torah, which only made matters worse, okay? That is not the uh, idea of the Messiah, okay? The other thing was the sin of the golden calf. The sin of the golden calf was a major fail because uh, Moses had these tablets that he had got, he received from the throne of heaven. They were made of divine sapphire. He, you realize he went into Shemayim. He went into that dimension and pulled tablets down from that dimension into our dimension. And they were broken forever. And the tablets that we received as a renewed covenant were made of earthly stone. So they were of a lesser substance. And we never got those divine tablets back. And keep in mind something else. When at, before Adam sinned, Adam was like a divine being. And there's lots to be written about that, lots to be said about that. But understand, he was like he was like he was like Superman. And then he partook of the fruit, and then he became, he you know, death entered in, pain entered in, fatigue entered in, all that kind of stuff. Gray hair, balding. Thank you, Adam. I said, you make it personal. You're not going to have a conversation. That you're not going to like. Well, again, guess what? When we received the Torah at Mount Sinai, there was not a blind eye. There was not a deaf ear. There wasn't a barren woman. There was no lame. There was no sick. We had weapons of warfare. The angel of death had no power over us. We were on the brink of absolute redemption of mankind. And then we blew it. But then, you know, the world kind of got, it got, kind of got better. We, we settled in. We had King David. Then we had King Solomon. King Solomon built this beautiful temple. It was magnificent. The Shekinah came down. It was glorious. It was wonderful. And then we started sinning again. So you have three things, Adam, the golden calf, and the destruction of the temple. The, when the first temple was destroyed, we never got that back. The second temple was a mere shell of what the first temple was. It never had the Shekinah. It never even had the Ark of the Covenant in it. And that's why Ezekiel starts talking about God's ultimate redemption, that there is going to be a third and final temple that the Mashiach will build, or bring rather, and it will be the original temple that's in heaven. And there will be sacrifices and all this kind of stuff once again. The point I'm trying to make is that's why we need the Messiah. We need the Messiah for all of that. You know, I've mentioned this before, but I wanted to say this uh, so that you could have the reference. There were four people in Jewish history that are recorded as having never committed a sin. 
meaning that they kept the Torah perfectly. You say, I, w- I was told no one can keep the Torah perfectly. That's not true. It's just not true. But in the Talmud, Baba Batra 17a, it lists these four people. And it says something very important, very profound. It says, the rabbis taught in Abrasia, four people died as a result of the serpent's counsel. They are Benjamin, son of Jacob, Amram, the father of Moses, Yeshai, the father of David, and Kilav, son of David. Those are the four who never committed an infraction. The only reason they died is because of the sin of the serpent. Now, what that teaches us is that Adam has an effect, a profound effect on us still, clearly. This is what we need the Messiah for. When Abraham brought Isaac to be sacrificed, the rabbis teach that he actually thought that that sacrifice of Isaac was going to undo the serpent's counsel and bring about the Ganadin life again. And when it didn't happen, he was disappointed. Now, let me read this last insight here. We'll just conclude here. We're going to continue on this theme at another time. It says, Roddick's, in, in Roddick's view of this, this discussion of, of 18, the problem, the problem is the subject of the proverb. It is a cry of anguish at the seeming injustice of their fate. Again and again, they had been told that Manasseh's sins had made the destruction inevitable. But why should they be punished for the sins of an earlier generation? It says the answer is contained in verse 19, which reiterates the lesson of Exodus 20 and verse 5, as well as Exodus 34 and verse 7, that God will indeed visit the father's sins upon the children where these later continued in his evil ways as the sages taught in the Talmud Sanhedrin 27b. They took hold of the deeds of their father in their own hands, as the Talmud says. In other words, what it's saying here is very important. What it's saying is that ultimately the destruction of the first temple was set seemingly in stone by the sin of King Menashe. So in effect, what we're seeing here is the destruction of the, of the first temple. That sin of Menashe was brought down upon all the children of Israel. But what the prophet is trying to say is, is because the reason this is the case is because nobody made teshuva. The nation did not make teshuva. And as a result, you continued in the way. Harav Burr sees the proverb as an expression of the stark fatalism. And I conclude with this. This is my final closing. This, I want, when I read you to this to you, listen, Lapid Judaism is all about rescuing people from false religion. Primarily Christianity because that's, that's our, our biggest target. Because we want to see people live a v- vibrant religious life. I'm about to read to you about a fatalistic mentality, and this is the mentality of Paul. It created a spiritual depression. It's why Christian music is often so sad and depressing. You ever listen to it? It's like country. You ever listen to Christian songs? They're very depressing. I'm nothing. I have nothing. I'm worthless and... It's very, it's very depressing. Whereas Hebrew songs are usually upbeat and we can do this, we can do this. It's a very much you can't make it happen religion. Harav Brewer sees the proverb as an expression of the stark fatalism which grew out of their perceptions. If they were being victimized for sins which were not of their own doing, then what point could there be in trying to better themselves? Was God's divine gift of teshuva viable, a viable system which punished one man for another's transgression? Again, the answer is that, of course, the road of repentance is open to them. God visits the guilt of the parents only upon an unregenerated generation. In other words, their idea was, hey, listen, if I can't, if I can't do this, if, I can't, if I'm just going to be punished for the sins of my father, then why even try? 
And that's the fatalism that affects so many people. If nobody, if everybody's a sinner, which is true, then why even try not sinning? But what people don't understand is that we're all sinners because we make bad choices. And we should all try not to make those choices. That's the fatalism that people need to be set free from. The Messiah came to redeem Israel from all of these colossal mistakes that we all made as a nation. Did everybody dance around the golden calf? No. In fact, the, 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 the sages credit the women. The sages credit the women and say, we didn't even participate in the golden calf. Right. The women were like, no. The, so not, but yet, were the women ultimately punished by not being allowed to go into the promised land? Yes. This is the difference between individual sin on a micro level and macro sin on a nation level. The, the Messiah came to redeem us from all of that as a whole. On the individual level, we have to make individual choices as to whether or not we're going to follow him in his ways. Amen. Bezrat Hashem, I hope that all that made sense. Baruch Hashem.